We're going to have a chance now for uh, some discussion. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you to do something that people don't usually do after a lecture like that, and I want you to talk a bit about yourself. Um, it's very unusual for somebody who's had been through a medical residency, had a totally traditional medical training, been to some of the, worked at some of the leading hospitals and academic institutions of the world, to come up and talk about spirituality, indigenous knowledge, different ways of thinking and knowing, um, and to be very inspiring and uh, articulate and passionate in the way you do that. Can you just, we have a very young audience here, and we're talking about a very new discipline. Tell us a little bit about how you got into, um, because when you started, you're very young, but you're not as young as some of the people <laughs> here. And may, how did you get into this different sphere of work, um, despite being a medical resident in San Francisco? Um, I wish I could tell you that there was a grand uh, plan. I, I bumbled around for 20 plus years. Um, doing lots of different things. But um, what I knew, when I was in 10th grade, um, I wanted to be an English teacher. Um, I loved literature. And uh, my English teacher seemed to think that might not be the best idea, <laughs> and um, uh, suggested that I read Lewis Thomas. Has anybody here ever mm -hmm. read Lewis Thomas? Mm -hmm. Not very many anymore. Um, he was a, a brilliant uh, physician and biologist. He ran the uh, Sloan Kettering Center in New York City and had a lot of other very senior appointments, but he was also a brilliant essayist. And he wrote three books of essays that are scientifically out of date, but still some of the most beautiful writing I think there is, um, called uh, The Lives of the Snail, uh, The Lives of the Cell, The Medusa and the Snail, uh, and a book called Late Night Thoughts on Listening to Mahler's Ninth. Symphony. Um, and in that last book, there was an essay called Things Unflattened by Science. And all of his writing had this extraordinary balance of deep respect for science and observation and nothing flaky at all. And yet, um, this pervasive sense of, of wonder. Um, and I think that um, made me feel that there was something really exciting there, and I started to pursue an interest in medicine and biology, but always with this curiosity. I mean, when I was at Harvard as an undergraduate, I spent a lot of time with E.O. Wilson, actually, right. Um, right. asking him what to do about these dual interests in both nature and the environment and medicine and health. And uh, he advised me to go to medical school because um, it would be easier to try to find a synthesis mm -hmm. from there. It wasn't easy to find a synthesis. Um, and I, you know, I spent 20 years um, doing residency, working in Tibet for two years, working at Conservation International for two years, working for USAID, um, being a practitioner in the field in the tropics. Um, but ultimately, I felt that while people were giving lip service um, to the idea that human well-being was tied to environmental conditions, what was missing was an evidence base, mm -hmm. that what we needed was actually a science mm -hmm. underneath um, mm -hmm. those sentiments. And so I ended up coming back to Harvard and doing a, a clinical research uh, fellowship and then uh, spending the last uh, 10 or 12 years um, just building research programs around some of these questions to try to show that it's possible and, and that mm -hmm. started to spread. Mm -hmm. So. There was no clear um, path at the time. It was a very sort of circuitous route to where I am. I think there's um, maybe a little more of a path now than there was then. We've spent, um, I mean, it's actually a decade this year since the first series that we published around climate change um, with Andy Haynes and Ian Roberts and others from the London School. Um, and it's taken us almost a decade to get climate and health taken seriously as a, as a subject. Um, but you're inviting us to have an even broader view, those bubble um, maps that you showed us um, with planetary health in the middle, but then all these other areas around them. What's your vision for where we go now as a, as a new discipline of planetary health, trying to bring in all these other disciplines? It's tough because the academy isn't set up 
to do what you're describing. Quite the opposite. The academy is almost set up to, to create even deeper silos with thicker walls between them. Yeah, I think it's a real challenge. And I meant what I said about mm. the urgency. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm worried about mm. where we are, obviously. And I think that there is urgency to restructuring the way we do things. I don't think we can address these challenges without doing that. And I think it's starting to happen. I mean, uh, Harvard's got to be one of the slowest places to change in the world. And um, we are starting to really seriously think about what structures would allow work not only across the School of Public Health, but across mm. the entire university in these areas. Um, but there's so much to do, and it's, it's, it's all of those things. It's funding, it's structures, it's training. Mm. Um, but in many ways, I think the work that you all have already done around climate and health has helped to pave the way. At least we have a little bit of a model, and that's, that's been really important in getting us started. And we have seen, I mean, in this country, and I, we're in the Wellcome Collection, which isn't exactly the same as the Wellcome Trust, but the Wellcome Trust is a couple of doors down the road. Um, we have seen the Wellcome Trust um, show incredible leadership in investing in this connection between the planet and health, and we have Anne Johnson here, who's a governor of the Wellcome Trust, who's been a fantastic advocate for that, and uh, we should thank you, Anne, for your leadership on this. What about the National Institute of Health? I mean, do you see similar moves, in positive moves in that direction there? Well, I, unfortunately, I think that um, right here in this room, we're in the sort of epicenter <laughs> of forward thinking okay. around these issues. So um, the Lancet, under your leadership, um, the Rockefeller Foundation in New York, and the Wellcome Trust have really been the visionary leaders in helping to um, give institutional support to um, these ideas. And um, it wouldn't have happened uh, without that. So that's been... Uh, I think that's been really, really important. But outside of this, um, uh, that relatively narrow group, um, I don't know of a single other foundation that's identified this as a research mm. priority. Mm. And there's certainly, the NIH has not identified um, even climate and health as a big mm. research priority, much less planetary health. So I think that's one of the most urgent priorities that we face is beginning to uh, convince uh, the government funders that um, a strict focus on these sort of disease-specific, organ-specific funding strains just isn't going to work in addressing the kinds of challenges that we're facing. Let's go to the audience. Um, so we'll take uh, two or three questions. We have two microphones. Um, please put your hands up and then say who you are and where you're from. Gentleman down here, please. And then lady there. So please... You go first, and then we'll take another question. Hi, George Wang from uh, Parkcell. Um, from uh, Parkcell, it's a CRO in based in London. Okay. Um, well, based in Boston, actually. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a controversial question, but it's more that based on the stuff that you've discussed, um, what would happen if, for example, we had some sort of um, accelerated ice age or pandemic where we've wiped out the human population? Would that be the solution to saving this planet? <laughs> because it seems that the evidence is quite clear see that the we're probably yeah. the, uh, the result of this. Myers advocates genocide. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's a little extreme. I think what we're trying to do is um, shortcut that. It's, it's, it's not a bad idea to hold that in your head as the most extreme. I mean, that, that may be, as, as Richard has um, argued, um, where we end up with no action at all is civilizational collapse. Um, I'm not absolutely sure whether that's where we end up or we end up with only uh, you know, four or five billion people uh, suffering you know, terrible consequences of environmental change. But either way, that's not where we want to go. And so the point is um, we really need to address these problems now so that we're not talking about a scenario like that. Please. Hi, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your work and not just the talk, actually. I find this deeply important. Um, I wanted to pick up on your, near the end, you mentioned the challenge of imagination. Um, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, so much so that in your, one of your early slides, you've got underlying drivers, you've got consumption, demographic shifts, and technology. I think something that we might call politics or culture 
actually belongs there. It's not just a mediating factor that culture can, can enhance your resilience. It's actually driving the whole thing. And as you say, it's our notion of our place in the world and our relation to other humans and other forms of life. I may have missed your name where you're from. I'm sorry, I, I omitted it. Jane Cooper, I'm a public health doctor who paddled upstream into social psychology <laughs> and is kind of, so, <laughs> yes. So, um, yes. One other thing, I don't know whether Sally Weintraub is here. She's a psychoanalyst who's done work on climate change and disavowal rather than denial. Um, our dif the human difficulty in accepting dependency, um, which other psychoanalysts also see as a driver of misogyny. So there are people who are doing really interesting stuff in that field. Can I finish with a very small comment? It's really hot in this room. Um, we seem to be burning energy. And can I just bounce off that thought into where are we with the Wellcome Trust and divestment in fossil fuels? <laughs> Uh, well, since neither of us work for the Wellcome Trust, I'm not sure we can answer that question. But this, this, wider, this wider point about cultural politics. Yeah, no, I love that point, and I think you're absolutely right. I, that schematic is flawed in a lot of ways, and, and one of the ways is that it implies a kind of um, unilinear directionality that clearly doesn't exist. So everything's sort of feeding back on everything else, and then if you try to map that, it gets confusing. But um, I love the idea of putting sort of um, how we think about our, our place in the world um, at the beginning of that. I, you know, I am so ignorant about this stuff, and I am I'm just sort of taking my first baby steps into thinking about this. There's a, I don't know if you all would know her because she's really a very much an American writer, but um, a writer named Terry Tempest Williams, who's sort of one of our real uh, poets uh, of place in the United States, and um, she's at Harvard right now. And we, and she and I have been thinking a lot about this. She, she describes this situation that we're in right now as not an environmental crisis and not a public health crisis, but a spiritual crisis. And this is all language, to be honest, mm -hmm. that I'm very uncomfortable with. Um, and so I'm speaking to my own discomfort when I talk about it. I didn't grow up in any faith tradition. Um, I don't have any uh, expertise. Um, but more and more, I'm wondering if that may be at the root of some of the, the issues. So I, I will continue to be thinking about it, and I love your point. Thank you, yes, here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Katrina Davis. I'm a researcher at the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London. Um, and I just wanted to kind of express one of the things that I think you're up against um, is that there appears to be almost so much wrong, so much that's going wrong, um, and in the realms of lots of unintended consequences, that it's easy to feel... Um, overwhelmed and you, you, you see this in the kind of nihilism of politicians about these kind of subjects and you, you see it in the exasperation of people who bought a diesel car having been told that it was kind of on the environment. Um, is there anything that you can think of to challenge that kind of nihilism so that people can see that, that a difference can be made? that something can be done? You know, it's a, it's a really, really important question. I mean, um, I remember Nick Watts uh, telling me here in London, who works on the Lancet Countdown, um, that when one speaks about these issues, one needs to be 90% um, positive and solution-focused and only 10% bad news, which I obviously have entirely <laughs> failed um, to achieve. Um, and I was thinking about that as I was thinking about my talk, and I sort of felt like, well, hell, I mean, these are real problems, and you know, step one as physicians is to actually make a diagnosis. And so part of this is about um, the diagnosis. But I agree with what you're saying. And I actually think, and it's a, a project that I don't know if, when I will have time to do. I've been talking to my 12-year-old daughter about doing it. She wants to do it with me, which would be super fun. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to write a book for a lay audience. She's going to be the one, she says, who keeps it from getting too hard to understand. But um, 
for a lay audience about a practical utopia. You used the term practical mm -hmm. utopia in your remarks at the AGU meeting in San Francisco, and they realistic stuck, utopia. or realistic yeah. utopia, that's right, in, um, in San Francisco. And this idea that um, there really is no reason, and it's why I get uncomfortable with the sort of catastrophists. Mm. Um, in my mind, it's sort of a toss-up whether we have a sort of catastrophic future or whether we have this realistic utopian future. Uh, and in this realistic utopia, I can certainly imagine a plausible scenario where you know, human population has stabilized and just as a result of the demographic transition, it's starting to fall. Where we've decarbonized the energy economy because we have to and we have to do that fairly soon. Where cities as a result of economic development, which is a persistent trend and urbanization is a persistent trend, have the resources to actually have lower ecological footprints so that the people concentrated in cities, cities have lower footprints and we're designing cities, cities so they're healthier places for us to live. And where as a result of all of that, you really do have more breathing room for the biosphere with every passing year. And I think that is a plausible scenario and I think we can get there. And if you ask me to put my money on something, I would say I think that's where we're gonna be. The question, is how much suffering are we going to allow to happen on our way there? How long are the you know, Donald Trumps of the world going to hold back uh, action which directly translates into more suffering? So there's both a where are we going to get to and how fast can we get there? It's E.O. Wilson's idea of the bottleneck. You know, what, what can we bring through? How much biodiversity are we going to lose in the process? How many people are we going to lose in the process? Or how many lives are going to be degraded in the process? So how quickly can we make this transition? But I think we can get there. So Hope. Maybe That's what we want. Hope. Please. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, Tom, is it on? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the talk. Yeah. Um, Thomas Pinkowski from Oxford University. Um, within the literature, there's a lot of evidence, and you provided a lot of evidence of the kind of the health costs of environmental degradation. Um, what about the potential health benefits, and, and kind of going beyond that, if we're thinking about optimizing landscape management to say meet the SDGs, do we also need to be aware of those potential health benefits? Absolutely, and I think that's a really, really important area for planetary health science. So um, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, in our own work, um, we are modeling the uh, connection between land use decisions in Indonesia, uh, the risk of fires on those parcels of land uh, resulting from those decisions, uh, the atmospheric transport <coughs> chemistry, the emissions from those fires, and then the ultimate population exposures to particulate air pollution. And connecting all of those things in a single model, we can actually calculate the health impacts of different land use decisions. And now we're do using a um, what's called the adjoint of that model uh, to create a policy support tool so that um, Indonesian officials can calculate how many lives they would save if they protected peatlands, and this is within the Peatlands Restoration Agency. So if they could protect you know, this million hectares of peatlands over the next 30 years, what would be the cumulative morbidity and mortality impacts of that? Um, that's an example of um, uh, using the science to actually quantify the dynamics, which you need to do first, and then creating a decision support tool so you can optimize your management of those systems for health. Um, Sana Sokolov and uh, Julio DeLeo at Stanford University have done uh, amazing work uh, in the river systems in West Africa where dams have really, really dramatically increased exposure to schistosomiasis. Mm. They've come up with a system of reintroducing uh, native prawns in those rivers, um, which not only is helping to control uh, the schistosomiasis, but is also providing uh, a source of income and uh, a highly nutritious food source um, for local <coughs> inhabitants. So again, the science to understand the dynamics and then the intervention to manage the system uh, in ways that optimize health. And I think that's the paradigm of what, what we need. Thank you very much. Please. Thanks. Uh, Robin Badley at BMJ. Um, 
I was just thinking off the top of my head there, you were talking, starting to talk about models, um, and I was in my head sort of drawing some parallels with clinical trials and whether um, one, one of the reasons, one of the ways clinical trials are sometimes sold to patients is that they, they get better care if they engage in clinical trials, they get better follow-up, they get more regular appointments and things. Is there a way of thinking or an argument to suggest that cre creating sort of more ecological models on a community level or a city level would be of benefit to communities in a way that w there'd be benefit in a, in a global sense that to sign up to them for um, sort of ecological interventions? Yeah, I mean, I, I love the idea. I, I think the big missing piece is that there's no money to fund planetary health science. So um, just actually being able to do those ecological trials, I mean, ecological trials at the level of a community are expensive. We're actually doing something kind of like that in Madagascar with a group of communities up in the northeast part of the Makira protected area. And, um, and they have uh, engaged uh, around just those ideas that this is going to address nutrition, infectious disease exposure, um, and it helps. But, but to start with, you need to actually have funding to do uh, experiments of that scale. But I think if you can, if you can that's a, an interesting way to pursue it. Yeah. Please. Hi, I'm Becky Parrish from um, Brunel University, um, PhD student. Uh, thank you so much for a great talk, and I think you may just have answered my question, <laughs> which was um, how do we tackle the perennial issue of data paucity, which is essential if we're actually going to have these effective interventions um, and well-informed solutions that you're talking about? We need science, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a huge need, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting place that we're in because we are all so impatient to uh, get going um, and try to solve these problems. And one of the problems is that funders are getting impatient and saying, you know, enough of all this science, you know, it's like uh, we've had enough of, you know, you sort of navel gazing, let's just go do it. We know the world is, you know, having problems, let's go address them. And the fact is we don't. No, there is a huge um, paucity of data, as you put it, and um, we need to characterize these systems better so that we can design interventions that really work. And at the, the sort of base of the pyramid needs to be uh, rigorous understanding of these connections between uh, changes in natural mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. and their human health impacts, some of which may be very positive and some of which may be negative. So. Um, we need to avoid this trap that I'm afraid we may be about to fall into of um, taking a few examples and from those examples saying, you know, environmental change is affecting health now, never mind the science, let's put all our resources into, um, you know, policy and um, interventions and, you know, governmental fora and things like that when really we need a robust science and that's going to be critical. I'm going to be a bit unfair and I'm going to pick on Anne because so if we can bring the <laughs> microphone down to... Um, um, you may not, you may not. But Anne, you've got a special place here for two reasons. One that I've already mentioned, that as a governor, I think they're called, for the Wellcome Trust, um, I think we can thank you personally for championing this idea within the Trust. And it would be interesting to get your perspective um, about how you did that and some secrets of success for Sam at NIH. But secondly, also, you chaired the Academy of Medical Sciences Working Party um, looking at public health in 2040. And of course, Sam's talking about this quite radical expansion of our idea of public health. And I'd love to get your reflections on your idea of public health over the next generation, which you've written so um, passionately about. Well, th thanks, Richard. And um, I, I think, actually, on the question of Welcome Now funding the Our Planet, Our Health scheme, that was a project which was somewhere in the eyes, I think, of Welcome to fund in that space. But actually, it was, in a way, the climate change, the first um, commission on climate change, which stimulated that because it allowed us to bring together a bunch of funders who were really outside their comfort zone. Mm. So I think the remarkable mm. thing about Welcome, where it's been a real privilege to, to be a governor of Welcome, is the independence of, the, uh, of some of these organizations that stand outside government and actually can sometimes bring together people to talk about 
the things that they don't feel comfortable talking about. And climate change was clearly in that space. And I have a question, actually, which I'm going to get in here, which is <laughs> another issue that people feel very uncomfortable about, which is one of the major drives of this, and this is population mm -hmm. growth. And we shy away from mm -hmm. that. And here we are with all the technologies in the world, millions of women without access to reproductive rights who want contraception, which yeah. was, you know, ducked out of in the 60s. As we, sorry, so that was just no, my no, pitch no, no. there. We'll um, we'll but to move sure on to the Academy of Medical Sciences report, mm. Health of the Public 2040, there's a lot of resonance with what you're saying about reframing how we see public health, which is why we call the report Health of the Public because we saw it in exactly the same way that you see this, is that many, many disciplines, and particularly the upstream drivers of, of health of the public, lie without the outside the biomedical domain. And therefore, we have to reframe the way we think about the health of the public to address exactly what you're talking about. This was actually the focus of the Academy's report, and with Rachel sitting beside me in the support of the Academy, we've been working for the last year to try and uh, implement some of the recommendations. Mm. One of the core recommendations is that we needed to bring together a group of funders to think very differently mm. about how we fund research at this interface. And that group will now be set up as a subgroup of our Office for Strategic Coordination of Health Research, and it will do exactly the kind of things that you're talking about, at least in principle, to try and bring funders together to think more broadly across some of these areas. Um, so these are critical issues for the future. The other issue, and I think you've alluded it, to it, uh, is what does it mean to be not just a doctor, but a health practitioner mm. in the coming 50 years? How should we frame and how should we train the next generation of health mm. practitioners? And I think that's a real challenge for us that we get people to understand not just the obviously the sickness of the patient in front of us, we all want a good healthcare practitioner, but how do we engage with some of the cultural issues you're addressing, but how do we also teach the traditions of public health as how they fit into clinical medicine? Mm. In other words, we teach people about reducing, not just you know treating the heart attack in front of you or worrying about their genome, which we must do, but actually talking about modifiable risk and teaching epidemiology like that, so we understand that we make the most effective interventions for the person with a heart attack, which includes their smoking, their exposure to air and so on. And we think about the things which can modify that risk. I think if we change clinical practice like that, we'll bring a different lens to public health. But that's moving right into the clinical interface from what yeah. you've drawn as a very big picture. But that was the point of the report. These are not separate disciplines. We have to bring them together. Reflections on that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, um, I'm not surprised um, that there's a lot of visionary leadership coming out of uh, the Welcome Trust, but I'm really encouraged to hear um, what you're describing. That's really exciting, and the, the funders meeting and that framing. So, um, what about population? I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased. Um, you can't get I, away from that one. No, I mean, there's nothing to get away from. No. I mean, it's uh, absolutely, and I'm probably remiss for not highlighting that as its own issue. I mean, I, it's such a, it's such a no-brainer at some level that um, it's almost so obvious you forget to say it. But mm. um, I just don't think there's any question that providing access to family planning. Um, and focusing on girls' education and uh, women's economic opportunities and empowerment are um, you know, central to all of this. If, if we had no problem with planetary health or climate change, they'd be incredibly important public health interventions just because of how important they are to uh, women's rights and to health, maternal and child health. Um, but in the context of the problems that we're facing, they just become even that much more important. So, you know, obviously we're not talking about coercion, we're talking about um, the fact that somewhere around half of uh, births in the world come to couples that don't have access to family planning and would like to be able to limit mm. uh, family size. Mm. And so being mm. able to provide that access is a really important public health service, um, but also would clearly impact some of the issues we're talking about. So, um, A small advertisement yeah. before going to our next question, and that is that next year we will be publishing 
a uh, commission with the Guttmacher Institute on sexual reproductive health and rights, which will oh. address many of these issues in a broader context of sustainable development to try and bring this whole, the whole okay. idea up to date. So it'll be Cairo in the post-SDG post era. Please, up there. Hi, my name's Michael Ias. I'm a junior doctor and also part-time policy consultant for the EAT Foundation, working on sustainable nutrition issues. Um, and I just got back from Bonn and the UN Climate Talks this morning, um, where there was, yesterday, there was a lot of discussion around health and climate and environment, and the kind of being interest, but perhaps a lack of action, and there didn't feel to be the same kind of urgency at the UN Talks this year, as opposed to perhaps the head of Paris when everyone was rushing towards a deal. And again, earlier this summer, the sort of high-level political forum on sustainable development, which is the review body for the sustainable development goals, again, there was a governance body discussing these issues, but perhaps not geared to deal with the kind of complexity that exists in the space of planetary health. So I want to pick your view, uh, brains on what you kind of think would be the optimal governance structures for planetary health. Should it be very local, <laughs> local structures, um, perhaps sort of as some of the examples from the US where states and cities are stepping up to lead on these issues, and also how you think the health community should engage within the sustainable development and environmental governance spaces? Nice easy one. Yeah, I thought you were going to ask me, should it be uh, at the international level or the local level or the regional level? And then I could just say yes, and I'd be done. But um, mm -hmm. because I, I, I don't think that you're going to map it out um, and impose it. Um, I mean, look at what's happened to our federal government. I mean, you might have had this grand plan of what was going to happen at the federal level. Well, that's not going to happen for the next three years. And so um, what's happening in the United States is reactionary, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. cities and states and even more um, civic action groups, uh, individuals that are um, getting organized and um, refusing to stop putting pressure to change some of these things. So um, I, I think it needs to be everything that can be done. And I think it needs to happen at every scale that it can happen at. And I actually think that often the, the highest scale is the last one to really, really make a difference. So that um, there's some super exciting new businesses starting mm -hmm. up that, um, you know, some of which are receiving awards. I think it's tomorrow with, uh, with Andy there that mm -hmm. I was involved in these Lighthouse Awards at the UN Framework Convention um, for Planetary Health. But um, companies, uh, that are um, finding, you know, campaigns to use uh, recycled plastics from the oceans and create a whole new sort of social plastic uh, commodity of cleaning up uh, plastics and recycling them. And if you can actually get a business model behind that and you can commoditize that, then you know you just have this enormous um, uh, power to take that to scale and you create a market for social plastic. So, you know, something like that coming out of the business sectors is sort of a disruptive uh, technology thing. Then there's, you know, activism, there's uh, small communities and you look at what's happening in places like Copenhagen and what, you know, an incredible world leader it is in showing us the way that a lot of this can be done. So I think we just, we need to, you know, try to fertilize um, these examples wherever they are until they become the norm and not the exception. But I wouldn't be holding my breath for that to be coming uh, from the top down. And I think this will be our last question, Charlotte. Um, hi, I'm uh, Charlotte Watts, so I'm from DFID, so I'm the Chief Scientific Advisor. So I first wanted to make a comment just to sort of counter the presentation that a little bit that governments aren't concerned about this and aren't thinking about this and aren't, aren't investing research funds in this topic. And so if I think about some of the activities that are our department are funding in this area, we don't always badge it as health. I think that's the difference. And so you know, quite often we'll be doing, we have bits of research, for example, to look at how do we support innovation to ensure poor households can access clean solar energy? How do we create new markets and new business opportunities for the poor around some of those clean energy technologies? Or doing research around how do we make cities work, both from a growth perspective, because we know one of the big drivers in the reduction in immortality is through economic growth. So how do we, how do we think about economic growth, but in a way that is sustainable and clean. Um, so my question for you is, 
What do you think adding the health sort of analysis on top of you know, our understanding of what might pull down CO2 emissions or how do we better understand the distribution of extreme events, how does that add um, to our understanding? What might be the, the new thing that that gives us that we don't have by not always following it all the way through to health? And then the second question is the politics bit of this, you know, and I think that's what's missing in your framework. You have governance, but you know, how do we, in the end, think about the analysis that changes the politics if we're thinking about that China is the, the country with the fastest raising CO2 emissions at the moment, or if we think about Trump in the US? And, and you know, is, is this analysis what we, we need to, to make the politics work as well? Um, well, so first of all, you know, it's, it's really exciting to hear. Uh, I, I know that DFID has been a real leader um, and um, all of us in the United States with these interests are starting to turn our eyes across the ocean um, as a result. And I'd love to learn more about what you're doing. I think um, some of the questions you're asking, my brain is having a hard time wrapping around and I think that's because um, well, maybe it's the failure of my brain, but it, it's also that they're, um, they're a little bit abstract and I tend to think about examples. So um, when you're saying what does uh, adding the health dimension really provide, um, I'm thinking about um, our work in Southeast Asia, for example. And if you were looking, as we've been doing for 30 years, at uh, the fires in uh, Sumatra as a, an environmental uh, problem, uh, and it's, they are a huge environmental problem. It's a, one of the most important biodiversity hotspots in the world and it's burning up. Um, but we haven't made a lot of progress there. But if you actually start to do the research to quantify what the health implications of uh, those land use decisions and fires are, you suddenly have a completely different constituency within Indonesia for addressing the problem. And instead of a bunch of tree huggers from Greenpeace saying, you've got to respect your orangutans, which is mm. the way we've gone at this so far, and I'm you know, guilty as anybody, um, you should love your biodiversity. Well, yeah, great. Um, I've got plenty of my biodiversity. What I don't have is anything to feed my kids tomorrow. Um, and so if you can actually make it clear that your kids are going to have a much higher likelihood of dying of acute respiratory infections as they are exposed to the particulate matter from those fires, you've got a new constituency. So I think mm -hmm. partly it's, it's um, reaching out to a different constituency, partly it's a different cost-benefit analysis, so the economic costs can be quantified, which are enormous, and governments are interested in that. I mean, we, we're talking to officials from the Peatlands Restoration Agency, and they were talking about the finance minister you know, doing the equation of what these fires were doing for tourism and for uh, health and realizing that the gain mm -hmm. in, you know, from the palm oil industry and timber and logging was very, very small compared to the cost uh, around health costs and loss of tourism. So I think it's just part of broadening it. But I, I have to sort of think case by case. I think it depends for each example. We're going to have to draw a close there. Please give a very warm thanks to Sam.